análises da Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium of North America. Atualmente, ele está trabalhando no Queensland Alliance for Agricultural and Food Innovation, da Universidade de Queensland, na Austrália. Ele continua a trabalhar no desenvolvimento de aplicações para tecnologia genômica em gado de corte, com um foco na melhoria de características economicamente importantes, principalmente no melhoramento da performance da atividade da produção em gado de corte no norte da Austrália. So, please, Matt. Thank you, Ismani, for the kind introduction, and thank, I'd like to first thank UFB for inviting me to, and the Stumpers for inviting me to talk today, and also the previous speakers who have done a very good job of making my life a lot easier. Some of the key concepts that I haven't really gone into, so like SNP genotyping and genomic selection, were actually covered very, very well earlier today, so thank you. So what I'm going to do, be, what I'm going to be doing is talking a little bit more a very big picture level about the application of genomics in the beef industry, predominantly in Australia, but also I'm going to touch a little bit on one of the projects that I helped out in my previous job, developing genomic selection within the United States. Okay, so um, what I'm actually going to talk about, a bit of an overview, and talk about the integration of genomics in, into the US and genetic Angus evaluation. I'm going to also talk a little bit about a very interesting project that we also had while in my time here at Pfizer where we developed a um, within her genetic evaluation and added genomics to that. So I'm not sure how many other single companies are running genomic evaluations even worldwide in beef particularly. Then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current research in, in Australia and how we're trying to deliver genomics into the northern beef industry where typically it's very, very hard to get genetic evaluation happening. But a little bit of background to where I work. I work in, if you look at a picture of Australia, I work in, in, in Brisbane. My group, called the Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Industries, has people spread out all over the Queensland. Each one of these red dots represents one of our groups, or where our people work. So as you can see, it's a very, very big and very diverse group. Uh, we have three, three groups within our institute. We have animal science that I'm a part of, we have plant breeding or plant science and we have food and nutrition. The other thing, I wasn't going to originally put this slide in but during my last two and a half weeks here, when I'm talking to the people from Brazil quite often they, they understand that Brazil has quite wide, uh, quite a lot of diversity in its climate. And in Australia, we, we have the, the same. People kind of think of Australia as all being hot and, and dry, and much of Australia is. So all of this region in here is very hot and very dry. So these darker areas are the hot areas. But we also have some cooler, more temperate climates. So below here is much more cool and temperate, more, more in line with, say, some of the areas in that in more temperate areas. We also have uh, down around the outside in the north, we have some very hot and wet wet conditions that our animals and our plants have to face. So it is actually hard to make a breeding program to fit all of Australia and, our in, and in our institute we focus on particularly Queensland but anything north of here where it is, is uh, the tropics. Okay, 
a little bit more background on genomic this was covered quite well earlier in today and the primary technology that we use in our application of genomics today in beef cattle is, is SNP chips. So these chips, um, the development of those then has actually revolutionised the way we, we deliver genomics in beef cattle. So within sort of three, the one example of this is that the cost of DNA genotyping is thousands per, per SNP actually genotype is a thousand times cheaper than it used to be. We, the chip, the genotyping we do is usually done on what everyone seems to term SNP chips. So these are these microarrays where on each one of these you put a DNA spot and it would, re it, at the end of the process, it returns either 20,000 markers in some of the low density chips that are commonly retail sold at around $40 in Australia, in the US, or 50,000 markers for the current research chip that is around $300. For every animal we put on there, we get back uh, three quarters of a million SNP genotypes per animal. So we're dealing with lots of data. Okay, a little bit more bigger picture of why this is this is my view, probably not everyone's view. Why is it important for the producers, particularly? Before before we had access to these SNP chips, whenever we delivered genomic technology to to beef producers, we'd go and ask them for a sample, we'd ask them for some money, and then we give them some some results. So we might go and ask them for a, for a hair sample or a semen sample, ask for some money and then deliver them some parentage. A little bit later on, a few months later on, six months, 12 months later on when the bull's been about to be sold, we say, well, can we have another sample? We'll genotype it and give you some breeding value. Then later on, we might have discovered that we've been Using a lot of artificial insemination, we're starting to get some um, defects, genetic conditions appearing in our population. So we really don't want to be selling or highly using bulls that carry these defects. So can we have another sample from your bull, please? We want to genotype it and can you also give me another hundred dollars? So obviously producers don't like that. So with that, that's all right. Back one. <laughs> One of the big differences that the SNP chips have made is that rather than ask for multiple samples and multiple amounts of money, we, the way that genomics is being delivered is in one package. So we get one sample, we deliver the parentage, we, with the um, customizable chips that are available now, we can have 50,000 markers plus add out our um, new mutations that appear. We can predict some genomic breeding values and we can also add major QTLs of interest to the, to the panel. So from the producer's point of view, this is a, a big improvement in, in the, what they, the way they see genomics being delivered. Okay, this is my in words definition of genomic selection. We heard uh, a little bit more information on genomic selection earlier today. But I, it's a quote from, from the same, not from the same paper, but from some of the same authors that we saw earlier today. So I, I like this definition it's, that Mike has in his paper. Genomic selection is just a form of marker system selection in which markers covering a whole genome are used so that all quantitative traits, low size, are in linkage consistently disequilibrium with one marker. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to have lots and lots of evenly spaced markers across all of the chromosomes of the, the animals or plants and use that to predict all of the QTL information in the animal. Now obviously, depending on the density and the experiment and all of the things that go into making a good prediction, sometimes it works a lot better than others. So let's um, just in very simple schematic form, let's just work through what, what that actually means in, in practice in, in a diagram. 
So we have a reference population animals with some genotypes and phenotypes. These genotypes, these genotypes, we have a marker. There are lots of these markers across the chromosome. And in between all of these markers, we have a detail effect. Mind you, this is what we're trying to do. This is not necessarily saying how it actually works, and there's lots lots of um, intricacies and details that go into it, but what we're effectively trying to do at each one of these markers, we're trying to estimate the effect that carrying this T allele of this marker has effect, the effect that it has on the trait of interest. And in this case, um, as an example, because I'm living in Northern Australia and I'm trying to produce, help them improve fertility, what we're doing is we saying what is the action with the age of that female and his So what we then do, sorry this is a bit small and I think nearly impossible to see, but then all we're doing is summing all of these effects up across all of those, all of those markers. Then the actual application bit is quite simple. We just genotype some more animals on that platform. We use these equations that we've built, and it could be with some of the techniques we saw today. It could be with phase A, it could be with G-block, it could be with kernel methods, it could be with whatever method provided the most robust prediction. We use that to estimate breeding values on the selection candidates and pick the best of them to use in breeding. Quite simple. When you say it like that, maybe not in practice. So why, why are we trying to do this? We're actually trying, not trying to do anything completely different, we're actually trying to just improve parts of the same thing that breeders have been trying to do for forever. We're just trying to improve the rate of genetic gain. So when we think about that, what can we do to change genetic gain? We can change the selection intensity, which is the proportion of animals that are selected from the number of candidates. So obviously, we, the fewer candidates we select, the more intensely we're selecting. We can change the accuracy of selection. Generally, we cannot change the, the variation, the genetic variation in the trait. And or the last way we can improve genetic gain is by reducing generation interval. Now, Within Jerry, who have been very successful, changing this generation interval at pretty much the same accuracy has been where they've made all of their gains. In beef, the opportunities are actually quite different if, than they are in, in Jerry, particularly in Australia. So there isn't particularly much scope for changing the selection, in depth, selection intensity in, in beef cattle. What we can do is we can to some extent, change the accuracy that animals are selected at. We can change the generation interval, which is particularly pertinent for traits that are measured very late in life. If we want to, if we would like to change the traits of the carcass, obviously we, we need a progeny test. It takes a long time to perform that progeny test. If we can use genomics to estimate breeding values, we can select animals on the carcass trait at as early as you can take a sample and we will later on in our presentation I'll give an example of that. Um, typically in beef cattle we're not actually changing the breeding program across with the genomics we're often making it more expensive which has been one of the reasons that one of the barriers to adoption in beef cattle. So what traits are we going to tra target for genomics? As I just discussed, traits that are measured after we would normally select animals, traits that are measured in one sex, traits that are expensive to measure, and a good example of that in beef cattle is feed efficiency, and traits that are difficult to measure. So I'll be showing a few pictures, which hopefully will help you guys maybe stay awake for the next 20 minutes. Uh, in Northern Australia, we're dealing with very, very expensive systems. There's sometimes more than up to 10 kilometers, 10 square kilometers per cow in some of these environments. So it's very difficult 
and expensive to go and find all those cattle and bring them in to, to take some measurements. Okay, so now we'll get on to some, some real applications. I'm going to start with talking about the application of genomics in, Ang in Angus in the US and, and uh, Australia. Now this is my diagram to, to orient me as much as everyone else about where we are in, in genomics in beef cattle. So I like to think of this the first first step that that happened in, in Australia in particular is we had some genomics out there in the form of parentage and in marker assisted selection type approaches where we had some candidate genes for traits like calpane and calpastatin that are markers for beef tenderness and quality. So we were we were trying to select on, on those. We also have we're tracking some genetic conditions. Um, it seems like a long time ago, but the next generation of, of genomic appeared, and this would only be three, three, four years ago, where we were using genomic selection using 50,000 markers in our breeding program. So the, uh, the products that, or the prediction equations I'm going to talk about are the predictions for 50k predictions for Angus in Australia, a little bit about how they were developed and deployed and their accuracy, a little bit about the Angus in the US, I'll talk about them within her genetic evaluation in Northern Australia, and just briefly touch on some of the research from the group that I work in. And just for completeness, I thought um, this, this whole scheme will be out of date reasonably soon in Australia as they're trying to move forward, rather than developing prediction equations, validating them, and then um, integrating them into their genetic evaluation, they're moving to this slightly new, new method or new model for delivery, which is a single step evaluation where the markers and the phenotypes and the pedigree are analyzed in, in a single genetic evaluation block run. Okay. So, in, in beef, and in Angus in particular, Angus is actually the first breed that had a genomic prediction integrated into their standard genetic evaluation. Uh, they actually have two competing companies providing predictions that are integrated into their breeding program. So they have commercial companies, uh, Pfizer, which is now the, the Vikings, and Identity, which is now GeneSeq, these companies change quite quickly their names and usually the people stay quite the same. So they provide predictions of genetic merit that are blended into the genetic evaluation. In Australia, we only have one couple of the companies. We have Pfizer delivering genetic predictions and they're, they're actually blended in, in two different ways in, in the two different countries. So um, unless there's some people that are really technical in here, they may not be very interested. But in the US, they use a correlated trait approach where they fit the genomic prediction as an extra trait in the genetic evaluation. In Australia, we use selection index theory to blend. So I just like to have lots of pictures to, in my mind to, to understand how these things work. So if we think about how genetic evaluation traditionally works, we have some performance and some pedigree, we do a genetic evaluation and we provide EBV to the selection candidate. What was happening three years ago was we also had, on top of the genetic evaluation, we had some genotyping companies that were building prediction equations using animals that they had got samples and phenotypes from, and they were providing EBVs based on the genomics for selection candidates completely independent of the breed society, which uh, some people weren't very happy of, happy with, because look, this one animation I've looked. So the basic problem here is you have two sets of EBVs, which again is not optimal for the producers. Which one do you trust? Do you trust it? Do you believe in the genomics and think that the your there's something wrong with the standard genetic evaluation where you you completely distrust the these um, nasty multinationals over here that are 
coming in and trying to tell me how good my bullies. It was a, quite a challenge. So how do we, the step to fix that quite, is um, quite a interesting step to being politically involved in. Technically, it's not actually that difficult, but politically, it is quite a challenging area. What we need to do is estimate the genetic correlation between the true breeding values and the, the EBV in a, some form of validation study. No, sorry. Once that's done, things kind of go back to normal. We, we have some information from the genotyping company that goes into the genetic evaluation, and the selection candidates just get one. One set of EBV. Now, this is a little bit of a favourite um, area of mine because I guess I had to. Uh, I was involved for three or four years in lots of discussions about it, from the commercial side about how we how we deal with this, the, the validation and calibration step. So it is actually quite complicated because we have what we have is a, a collaboration in essence between three groups that may or may not want to work together. We have to have a collaboration between the people that provide the genotype, the people that provide the genetic evaluation, and the breed society. So these three groups to integrate and only into their breeding program have to agree on lots of different things. They have to agree on the blending methods, they have to agree on particularly on the design, the validation study, whether it's adequate, what whether they believe the accuracy of the testimony from the validation study. But the key point is once we deliver that, the delivery to producers is actually quite hidden from them. They don't see any real outlet change in the information they deliver. So we'll start a little bit, just in brief, with the genetic selection in the United States, with a partnership between US Angus and Pfizer. The current prediction equation or chance found in hand breeding values has includes 18 traits with realised accuracies that are actually quite high, um, on average around 0.54. And they really cover some of the key beef production traits. So this was all possible because there was very good collaboration between Angus and Pfizer. We were able to get access to solid, robust phenotypes and phenotypes to, to build these genetic evaluation. Within Australia, it's a very, very similar story. Other than, I guess from my point of view, the, the actual groups involved were a much more looser collaboration. We have two less traits. Unfortunately, we missed the residual feeding take and, and some another target trait. The realised accuracies are a little bit lower, but still quite a bit if used in the right production system for the right for the right purpose. They're actually very very useful information, and they definitely add quite significant accuracy to many animals that they target. So just a little bit of a sum sum up. If you look at, if you went on to the Angus website in the US today, where would you, where would you find genomic information impacting on this, this standard report? I don't expect you to be able to see the individual components here, but up the top we have some information on the animal, whether it was, uh, whether it's carrying genetic defects. We have its pedigree and we have its breeding value. So I think in some ways, Genomics has been quite successful because we have some information on the genetic condition, the defects, the genomics adds information to the parentage, and we also are uh, increasing the accuracy of the screen base. So a little bit more on, um, I don't think my job's done, so I always like to think about what would be the next thing that would make a big difference to the industry, so what is being worked on in Australia currently is to extend the range of breeds that are covered by genomic prediction. Currently, we have only covering Angus, which is around only about 30% of the registered beef animals. So there are prediction equations that, that are 
have been validated for a number of reads and they'll be released early next year. And there's quite a bit of research in particularly in Armadale about how to deliver a single set genomic prediction where they aim to actually have single step prediction methodology up and running by the end of two, and tested by the end of 2014. In my group, we're focusing really on how to collect and build better phenotypic databases for hard to measure traits such as particularly fertility in the north of it, our major challenge, and feed efficiency in carcass traits. So this one's a uh, little pet project of mine that I really enjoy talking about. So this is a project where uh, genomic information was implemented into a large northern pastoral company. And it's one of the particularly pertinent ones, the application of genomics, because without genomic technology, it's very hard to make genetic improvements in the north. So I apologize, this is going to be very hard to see from the back, but what you might be able to appreciate, if you can see these little green, green dots on the map, these are the actual farms that this company runs. So pretty much you can see, almost see some of these properties from space. So the company was founded in 1877. It has 600,000 cattle on 14 stations. That's the course. And they, they produce around 65,000 cars per year. And one very clever person the last time I presented this said, well, how come that is so low compared to the number of cattle? The reason is in a very expensive condition, so it actually takes often two and a half years to get animals to market. Therefore, that a large part of these 200,000 animals are animals that are during their grow out phase. So NAPCO, for quite a few years, has had a very traditional breeding structure. They have a nucleus where they, where they try and measure the, the animals as extensively as they can. They have a multiplier where they only measure information from those animals when they come into the yard, which is maybe once a year. And they have a commercial enterprise, which is most of the cattle, where they don't actually see them or do any measurement on them. So if you think about genomic selection, the key thing, key driver for genomic selection is accurate and lots of phenotypes. In this particular production environment, there's not very many phenotypes. So in the nucleus at the moment, or traditionally, they would measure parentage, they would measure, they would collect weight, growth, circumference, do scanning. In the multiplier, they don't have any parentage. They may have weaning at yearly age and above. They might have scuttle circumference. But they don't have parentage. They don't have contemporary groups. So the accuracy of those breeding values is quite low. And obviously, as I said, in the commercial herd, there is no measure. So just to give you an idea of how extensive this, this is, this is just one, one paddock. They don't muster by aeroplane, but they go and find the cattle by aeroplane. So this is one paddock. So why, why did they uh, get involved in genomics? They wanted to, in, initially they wanted to enhance the accuracy of the, the nuclear CBV, but they also wanted to produce an MVP, I would find this, this is just the Pfizer's term for um, direct genomic value, so the prediction based on market alone. They were hoping to reduce the cost of full production, improve fertility, eliminate horns, and attain parentage, particularly in these multipliers. So, how are we going to find Oh. Oh, good, okay. I don't, I don't think it's a bit worried about speed up. Okay, they, the breeding program and this property started quite a while ago and they have built a stabilised composite. In Northern Australia, we still have we have a lot of Brahmin animals which we need for their adaptation to the environment. They were crossed with shorthorn, so a European or an English breed, to form an F1. Then we then they crossed 
didn't say we, it was, it was started 20 years ago, it was before I was doing genomics. Uh, they were crossed with the F1, were crossed with F1 Brahman and Charlie. We have another group of animals that are also constantly coming in. These are African huff, African or adapted Bosporus, crossed with traditional Australian British breeds. And finally we have F2s across the F2 Scarbrage. The idea is to have a final composite that has 50% adapted genes. So we have 3H Brahman, 1H Africanda, the adapted Bosporus, and the rest of the composite is yeah, the rest of the composite Bosporus. So just a little bit of a schematic of how the genetic evaluation uh, traditionally works. So we have a nucleus herd, we have the genetic evaluation provider, we have the multiplier herd. So the nucleus herd provides um, information to royalties. They ran a progeny test. From, from this, we, we put together a database of pedigree performance form a standard genetic evaluation and deliver EDV back to the commercial herd. We notice traditionally no information flow back to the multiplier. The only way genetic improvement happens in the multiplier is all from the nucleus herd to move over to the multiplier. That is what drives the genetic improvement. So once we add genomics to the mix, the opportunity is we first we increase the accuracy of the nucleus herds. So on top of that, we actually can provide some genetic information back on the multipliers. So now they can actually perform selections on the bulls they send out to their, to their commercial farm, their extensive commercial farm. I don't really want to dwell on this one because I think personally the, the improvement in accuracy of the in the multiplier herd is much more important whether we, by adding genomics to the prediction equation, we can, to an average animal with a record, we can improve its accuracy from 0 0.5 to 0 0.67 for winning weight. If the animal starts a little bit higher, at 0.65, we can still improve the accuracy of the genetic breeding value to point. However, I think the really the big big take home is in why they wanted to deliver genomics in this herd was in the multiplier. So in the multiplier business, they had very few records to select on. And once we actually have the GEDBs, they have a full set of information on on the standard growth traits, some of which they already had, but also robust predictions on carcass traits. So, in essence, they've moved the multiplier from having an accuracy of zero to having an accuracy that is almost comparable with the nucleus. They're now also able to select the very elite multiplier bulls. The multiplier is a much bigger group and use some of those multiplier bulls are actually going back into the nucleus now. This is a, a picture of um, then sorting out the bulls to go to the commercial farms when they, the first year that they presented genomic breeding values at the company in April 2012. What I hope, if Matthias goes back up and looks at the same process next year, I hope he takes a picture and these guys here, hopefully, are actually looking at sheets with the breeding values of these bulls. So, I had the I'm in quite a luxurious position in some ways because I, when I was at Pfizer, I helped out in delivering this technology to, to the farm. But now I'm back in academia at the University of Queensland. I can actually sit back and think, what are the positives and negatives of this, this type of approach? And I think there's three key things I can think are distinct advantages of being able to deliver this technology in, in this sort of setting. First is, because we actually have a single population that we're working with, 
effectively we have a lower population size than for a complete breed, which increases our effective accuracy. We have predictions of power to the production system that we're delivering the technology in. These nucleus animals are in very similar conditions to the commercial herd. The third distinct advantage for Panapco is that the development time when they're applying this within their own system is much lower than if they had to wait for the industry to measure and select animals from across the whole industry, get phenotypes across the whole industry and deliver such a thing. So they're actually being able to implement something at least two years ahead of where they would have if they had to wait for the industry. The key disadvantage for them is now they're actually using this prediction equations that are built within their herd. There's no guarantee that if they go and sample a, an animal that they're interested in from another farm, even next door, they're not, can't be 100% sure that the genetic evaluations will work within that herd because they weren't covered within the same population. Lastly, if we think about the total dollar spent, I guess in some ways, if the same amount of investment had been spread across the whole industry, maybe there would have been more overall benefit to the, to the national genetic improvement. But I personally, I think that's a, a kind of minor disadvantage compared to all of the advantages that they've received from this technology. In summary, for me, example, on this farm, they now have a genetic evaluation, they get freely ready to the multiply wolves, which they didn't have. They get parentage for all of their, their animals, particularly sire parentage. They are able to also assess the horn status of each of their animals. So I'd like to think that they've moved from the independent test to something more integrated, the more integrated approach that I discussed in my very first slide. Okay, now I'll come to a little bit of research that hasn't been delivered yet, but it's more the research that has been performed in the last year and a half, two years, within, loosely within the group I work with, but within a much bigger collaboration that's required to build the industry, industry databases of phenotypes and phenotypes. So what we're aiming to do is look at genomic approaches to improving, integrating genomics in Northern Australian beef improvement programs. So we're particularly interested in reproductive traits. So we want to develop better tools for genetic selection. We want that to feed into better genetics and improve reproduction rates. Now one of the, the key challenges in reproduction is that the standard traits that we measure, so if we measure type of puberty or longevity or all of the reproductive traits that we traditionally look at, especially the ones that come from pedigree, have low heritability, they're often measured, and they're often measured late in life. So what we were tried to perform in this particular project was to look at some more uh, narrow, more specific phenotypes that contribute to reproduction. So first one in, in heifers, to assess the age that the heifers reached puberty, we were looking at the age that the first corpus luteum was observed. And this is quite an intensive phenotype, we have to have people out in the field with an uh, ultrasound scanner scanning reproductive tracts every three weeks on big groups of animals until they see a, their first clip to the team. Scrotal circumference is the measure we're using bulls. That's much easier to measure. I guess unless the bull is particularly wild then you have to get your head down around your leg. In older cattle, what we were looking at as our market our more finely tuned traits of postpartum and estrus interval. So this is the amount of time between when a cow has her first calf <coughs> and when a corpus luteum is the first corpus luteum after birth is observed. So that basically is the time between her having a calf and her being ready to join and getting calf again. In wolves what we have used is a percent normal sperm at the swimming pool, the full breeding soundness evaluation. So from each of those bulls, we collect the sperm sample. It's assessed under the microscope. 
So I'm actually not talking about genomics for a minute at least. So first thing we look at was the quantitative traits, the standard pedigree, we have our measurements. What are the heritabilities of these traits? So in this is in Brahmin, the heritability for scotus circumference is quite high, 0.6. Standard normal sperm is kind of low, moderate. And the nice thing here is this female trait, age of first CL, is quite heritable. And the same with postpartum and estrus. And the other interesting thing that is not just specific to this data set is that some of the male traits that we can measure, so scrotal circumference, have an impact, a positive impact on, on the female trait. So bulls that have higher scrotal circumference have, tend to have lower age acuity and tend to have lower postpartum and estrus. So we can actually select on bulls and on and have an impact on female fertility. And like, likewise, percent normal sperm is highly negatively correlated with postpartum and estrus. So this is saying that the animal, the bulls that have, or sides that have high um, percent normal sperm, their female, their daughters tend to have less time between having a calf and being ready to be bred again. So, take home here, it is quite often in Australia people say reproduction is too hard, we'd rather not bother selecting it for, for fertility. But, so this is a, especially for, for Australian audience, this, this is a very important point. It is possible to do genetic selection for reproduction in northern beef cattle. So if we look at the impact of genomics on four key traits, we just compare running out pedigree drop to genomic blood. In all cases, we get at least a small to moderate increase in the accuracy. Um, two things about this graph. First thing is, even though it's a small increase from in these female traits, we have to remember that in most animals aren't going to have any information on their fertility to select for when they're happy. So the actual increase go, it observed for individual farmers is probably going to be more like from 0 to 0.4. Yeah. OK, so actual increase is going to be quite dramatic. Um, the last thing to this, this is this is the original um, cross validation results. Currently, the, these predictions um, are being tested in using industry size in the final stages before they're delivered to industry. So, hopefully, next year, the, at least some breed prediction equations based on these, these traits and these rules will be used in the Australian beef industry, although the, the accuracy observed may be different to in this particular slide. So, yeah. Final point. And to reiterate again, the genomic prediction can actually be made available for animals without that particular thing. So, I think I've done it reasonably well. Uh, in conclusion, robust uh, genetic evaluation, including Genotypes are available for Angus within Australia and the US based on research. There will be breeding values across the Australian industry for fertility and possibly adapted beef cattle the next year. And I'll provide a demonstration where a large integrated herd can actually include genomics to improve their genetic program right now with the right phenotypes and, and the right investment. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I need to acknowledge all of the, obviously the, oh, what I've presented here isn't all my own work. Most of it actually, in fact, is, is work that was done by large teams of people. So I'd like to acknowledge the funding from the uh, Queensland Department of Agriculture, Midlock Livestock Australia, lots of help from a lot of work by Animal Genetic and Breeding Unit in Armadale. Most of this work was carried out by a very big research 
Brand Prep or Research Centre that's been running for nearly 20 years in Australia, CSRO, and is delighted to provide you some data and information. Thank you. Não, vai dar só o, o MC. Bom, enquanto as perguntas não começam a chegar, eu vou fazer uma pergunta para o médico. Porque, é, com relação é, à pecuária no Brasil, existem duas, duas questões é, principais. É, eu vou. Eu vou seguir em tiro mais difícil, porque eu tenho casa 6 horas, eu te mando, estou no curso aqui. Já. Então, né, thank you for your livestock. Nada, nem lembrava disso. Uh, Só uma coisa no mercado. Uh, Falou. Uh, Nada. Você tem um aumento na quando você tem um aumento na quando você tem um aumento na is it worthwhile in many ways to consider the economic of the whole system of production? And the second one is, I was questioned by a producer a few months ago about who is going to pay for the tuna cutting because his point was, okay, we uh, pay a company to give us our estimated uh, or genomic breeding bed and we have to pay for our day. Okay, so uh, people is more or less struggling about the ownership of the genomic data. Is this data from the owner, is this data from the breeding association, or is this uh, data belonging to the company that the genome evaluation and the genome has? Okay, that's close enough. That's two very good and very difficult to answer questions. Uh, first thing is the accuracy is quite a challenging thing to get our minds around. The biggest biggest um, consideration first is how these predictions are going to fit into the production system. Are they going to add enough accuracy for the traits that are important to measure? So if the genomic predictions are only going to be used for weaning weight and yielding weight and the traits that we can already measure, then I think the answer would probably be a clear no. But if we're actually providing useful information on traits that otherwise we have nothing on, then they become very interesting and very useful. So we actually need to do a case by case and production system analysis to decide, or to help producers decide whether the technology is for them. And it wasn't one of my jobs while I was in my previous role to do you know, um, these case studies or um, economic valuations of the technology, but those things can be done and they do exist. Uh, now, the, the second second question is even more challenging. I don't think there's a various a across the board straight answer for that. In the case of NAPCO, it's all very contained, so they uh, made all the investment and they retain all of the benefit of that, which is one of the nice advantages for them having their genomic evaluation in-house. In Australia currently, where we're blending the selection index, the people that pay for the genotyping are the only people that get an increase in accuracy of their breeding values. And I think there's, there's lots of ways to argue who, who should pay, but I think if the technology is providing enough information, 
if it's increasing the accuracy of the pit kill bulls, you would hope that the increase in accuracy is feeding into higher prices for those those animals at sale. So I would hope that the market would, to some extent, sort that out in the long term. But definitely in the short term, when we're developing prediction equations and we're training, it is a difficult question. Algumas tem perguntas da plateia? Sendo assim, gostaria de agradecer novamente ao Neto. Então, por favor, uma salva de palmas para o professor.